Hello, I am Tia Tomlin, breast cancer survivor, a young advocate alumni of LBBC's Young Advocate Program, and the Knowledge is Power Program Consultant for the Black Breast Cancer Symposium. Today, we're going to be talking about health disparities in managing treatment side effects. Specifically, we're going to focus on managing pain. Joining us today is Dr. Patricia Washington. Dr. Washington has been an oncology nurse for over 35 years, receiving her PhD in nursing from the University of Texas Houston Health Science Center and postdoctoral study at MD Anderson Cancer Center's Department of Symptom Management Research in Houston, Texas. Currently, Dr. Pat serves as the Gulf Coast Clinical Nurse Educator for Puma Biotechnology. Pain and managing pain is a difficult issue for people to discuss with their doctors for a variety of reasons. It's also well documented in the research literature, as well as from reports of women themselves, that women, Black women, and the BIPOC women do not have their pain appropriately addressed. As recently as oct last October, a study published in the Journal of Practical Pain Management found that BIPOC people with metastatic cancers were far less likely to receive adequate pain management meds compared to their white counterparts. We recognize that our institutions and providers need to address health disparities. And as we work towards that, we also want to provide you with strategies and information to help empower you to get effective care and avoid more suffering. Dr. Washington is here today to help us and help you with that. Welcome, Dr. Washington, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate that. Awesome. Dr. Washington, as I stated in the introduction, this is not a new topic. What are some of the reasons BIPOC breast cancer patients do not receive adequate care for their pain? Well, there are various uh, barriers to uh, optimal cancer pain management in terms of how they might impede cancer pain treatment. And they include things like inadequate pain assessment, uh, the patient's reluctance to report pain, uh, inadequate knowledge of the staff regarding pain management. Uh, there's a reluctance also uh, in this population uh, to take opiates because we know that, you know, oftentimes they are prescribed to help to manage uh, cancer pain. There also may be a lack of staff time to attend to the patient's pain. And one of the studies uh, pointed out that there are can be quite a bit of paperwork that goes along with prescribing uh, these uh, opioids or just pain medicine in general for patients. Other uh, barriers include lack of access to a wide range of analgesics and uh, ex an excessive state regulation for prescribing analgesics. You see that in the news now quite a bit. And so, you know, those state regulations can uh, be a big barrier to uh, you know, prescribing uh, these analgesics for patients with uh, cancer pain. And, the, and also the final thing that, I, that comes up in the, in the literature is the lack of access to professionals who practice specialized methods. Now, one thing that uh, I would like for you to keep in mind is that the prescribing of analgesics may be directly or indirectly related uh, to the patient's negotiation of pain treatment with their healthcare provider. So, so basically the manner in which the patient negotiates may depend upon you know, various factors. And so some of those factors include you know, the patient's past experience with pain relief, any side effects that they may have experienced in the past, uh, fears related to analgesic use, oftentimes, especially with elderly, um, uh, cancer, breast cancer patients or cancer patients, patients in general, oftentimes they think about, you know, becoming addicted to uh, their pain medicine. That's a big concern. And then finally, um, you have to also consider individual and cultural preferences for analgesics. And a lot of times uh, when I was working as a nurse, uh, patients with uh, cancer pain often uh, relied upon home remedies. Uh, to, to control their pain, but oftentimes they were not effective. But so those are just some of the things to just kind of keep in mind when um, working with this particular uh, patient population. Thank you. Now, what would you say are some of the barriers they face in treating pain? 
you know, many um, African Americans or people of color uh, have concerns about, like I said, becoming uh, possibly becoming addicted to their pain medication, particularly the opioids. And along with that, there is also a concern about developing a tolerance, which would lead to the need for additional medications. And, um, you know, these opioids do not come without side effects. And, you know, one of the biggest things that patients would say to me would be, you know, I don't want to become addicted. Or if they had tried them, they'll say, well, you know, this constipation that comes with the use of this uh, medication, I just can't tolerate it. So you really have to uh, consider that. One thing to keep in mind is that these patients, especially older patients, tend to be very stoic in nature and may not even report their true pain experience. And uh, one thing that I did find is that oftentimes uh, these uh, individuals would equate pain with a worsening with worsening of their disease. So they kind of felt like, oh, I'm having pains, the pain and the end is near, you know, so there is that correlation. Um, with, uh, you know, pain. So oftentimes they don't even mention it because sometimes they're afraid that, you know, if they're on therapy, they may not receive the therapy. In other words, they they feel like the physician may give up on them and they may have to go to hospice, things like that. So it's really uh, important to, to, to keep that in mind. And also remember that in the, the pop, this particular population, pain is often an expected characteristic of the cancer experience. So they expect that, you know, I'm going to have pain. It just goes with the territory. There's nothing I can do about it. It's just there and it's going to happen. Now, in one of your research interests, it's the idea of fatalism. Can you tell mm -hmm. us what is fatalism and how does it impact symptom management? Well, Cancer fatalism is a term that is often used in the area of cancer prevention, uh, early screening and detection, and, uh, and also you see it being used in uh, clinical trials among uh, people of color. And so cancer fatalism uh, is a, an individual's belief that death is inevitable when cancer is present. And so these individuals may believe that cancer is a death sentence. Most of the time they do. So it doesn't matter what I do. I'm going to die from the cancer. There's no way to cure it. You know, I'm going to die. So that's that's the, the basic definition of, of cancer fatalism. And um, there is research out there that has suggested that in general, you know, African-American or Black women and men are, are more fearful of cancer than the general population. And although these individuals acknowledge cancer severity, they tend to disbelieve or discount the relationship like between cancer and many of the known carcinogens. They oftentimes underestimate the incidence of cancer and tend to be pessimistic or fatalistic about its cure and, and are generally hesitant to seek medical advice. Uh, and in this case, the, their medical care is delayed or forfeited. So those are just, you know, the basics behind um, the impact of these uh, fatalistic attitudes uh, in various, uh, various areas of cancer, not just uh, cancer screening and early detection of clinical trials, but, you know, just in general. So Dr. Pat, you know, why is it important for someone with a breast cancer diagnosis to be able to talk to their doctor about pain? Well, what we do know is that uh, good communication is essential to getting continuous relief for any pain you may experience due to breast cancer or its treatment. And we also know that, you know, when you're having pain, it can be indicative or indicate a more serious, something that's more serious. And so you definitely want to be able to, um, to communicate that with your doctor so that they can know. And also the other thing that we, we also know about pain is that it can af affect the healing process. So, you know, there are things that can be done to help you, but, um, you know, it's just important to be able to communicate that to the physician because, you know, the physicians only know what you tell them. Right, so it's important to 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 like I said earlier to to write down in your notes the type of pain and, and be as descriptive as possible with them, so they can know which direction uh, to go in terms of pain management. And then, if your pain is not being managed well, 
you know, it helps them to identify other interventions that can help to um, alleviate, help you to alleviate some of the pain associated with your cancer. So what suggestions do you have to help people to be able to have this conversation and talk to their doctor about pain or any other side effects that they may be feeling? Okay. So good communication, like I said, is essential to getting uh, continuous relief for your pain. And, you know, this may take some trial and error to find the right pain control regimen, but just know that your physician will work with you to uh, get the relief that you need. And I recommend, you know, keeping a pain diary and bring it with you to each appointment. That's key because oftentimes, you know, we get busy and when we get there, you know, we're worried about the appointment. For instance, if you have had scans, you know you're gonna be getting the results of that. That can cause some anxiety. And you may, once you're in front of the doctor, you may actually forget all of the things that you, you wanted to discuss with the physician about your pain. And then uh, it's important to discuss which side effects you're willing to tolerate and which ones you find unacceptable. For instance, we know that these pain medications can come with various side effects like constipation. You know, you may be working and, and it may cause drowsiness. And so it may uh, uh, impair your ability to work or drive or take care of your family. Um, also discuss ways to prevent or treat any side effects of your pain medicine. That the, your doctor and your nurse can help you with that. And if your pain is not being controlled, speak up. You know, if it's not being controlled, if it's not working, just make sure that you make your physician or nurse aware of that. And then the other thing I recommend is bringing along a friend or a family member uh, with you to the appointment if that's allowed. And uh, the reason for that is because oftentimes your family members or friends may notice things, you know, related to your pain that you may not even be aware of. And sometimes, you know, these pain medications uh, can cause you to be drowsy and you may not pay attention, you know, to the signs, but your family and friends that are on the outside looking in certainly can help you to have that conversation uh, with your physician so that you can get adequate uh, control of your pain. Thank you. Well, you know, hearing you talk about, you know, it's important for us to have conversations with our doctor. It made me reflect on when I actually went through treatment mm -hmm. and I did communicate to my doctor about the pain that I was in and it actually took them two weeks for me to see pain management. And in that instance, I didn't feel like I was being heard. So what do you think uh, or what recommendations do you have to share with those who are tuned in on what they can do when they feel like they're not being heard? So if you're feeling like you're not being heard, I think the number one thing to do is first of all, have make your uh, physician or healthcare provider aware that you feel this way. So acknowledge that to them. And then also I think saying things like, you know what, I know you're very busy, but I really need you to listen to what I have to say about my cancer pain today because it is of great concern to me. I'm just not getting the relief that I need. And uh, I really want to address this issue of pain so that I can experience the relief that I know I can uh, achieve. And so I think stating this up front will most likely capture the, the healthcare provider's attention. You know, you, sometimes you just have to, to, you know, just stop them dead in their tracks and they will take the time to address it with you. What I recommend though, is that when you're there, make sure that you have uh, bring with you, you know, all of the things that you're experiencing, um, you know, so the, and the type of pain you're experiencing, that's key because they need to know where this burning, stabbing, throbbing, you know, when does it occur? Does it occur with activity or when you're sleeping? Is it preventing you from sleeping? Are you sleeping too much? You know, things like that. I think it, the more descriptive you can be with your physician uh, or your healthcare provider, will really help you to, to address the issue of pain and help them to help you. So, you know, you have to make them aware of it. That's just key. And sometimes just stopping them and saying, listen, we need to talk about this pain management and go from there. Now we've discussed what patients can do, but generally mm -hmm. speaking, what do healthcare providers need to understand about their role in providing effective treatment? Okay. So when looking at the research, um, 
some of the barriers uh, associated with pain management indicate that people of color can benefit from educational interventions that dispel myths about opioids. And it is important to teach these patients to, uh, to teach these patients to communicate assertively about their cancer pain with their healthcare providers. So some things that I recommend is like, when you're speaking to the patient about managing their cancer pain, it's important to use simple explanations and terminology that are common to the group which you're speaking. And you may not know what's common to that particular group, but simplicity is always best. And, it, and to me, it doesn't matter to me what their socioeconomic status is, you know, how educated, you know, I believe simplicity is key. And so what I recommend for healthcare providers is to utilize examples to communicate uh, concepts. That's always a great thing. You know, give them, you know, state the whatever it is that you want them to know, and then give them an example. And then I think it's important to, to check in with the patient regularly, you know, during the conversation, just to make sure that they understand what you're trying to communicate. Uh, also, it's important to let the patient know that there are no bad or silly questions because some people don't respond well because they think, well, it's a stupid question or a silly question. You know, I think the most important thing to, to remember is that knowledge is power. And so just upfront letting them know that, you know, they can have that heart to heart with you and it doesn't have to be fancy language. Just tell me what you're feeling and we'll work through this so that we can take care, you know, of your issue of pain. And like I said, just, Encourage them to keep keep a journal or jot down questions that they may have for the, the physician or, or healthcare uh, practitioner on each visit. And then I think it's important to use a, a visual pain scale with pictures rather than just asking the patient on a scale of zero to 10, what is your pain level? Because zero means no pain. 10 is the worst pain you can have, but they're like... Um, nine different levels in between that. So if you use a visual, like this pain scale that shows uh, that that gives the writing or it, it, in, it indicates the type of pain and then there's a picture, a little face that's grimacing or not grimacing, that, that's a little bit better because uh, people can relate to that. It's something that they can you know, visually look at and point to where they are on that scale. So I do recommend visual pain scales with uh, pictures. Um, and then outside of using pain scales to measure the patient's pain level, I think it's important to assess their pain treatment experience and some examples of questions that can be asked, you know, of the patient related to their treatment experience include things like, can you tell me some things that you're doing to manage your cancer pain? What are some of the things that help with your cancer pain? And can you explain to me why they are helpful? What are the things that do not help with your cancer pain? And then once again, can you explain to me why they, you feel they're not helping? And then finally, what has been your experience of, of cancer pain treatment with medications? And then there's another group of questions um, that can be asked of the patient. And this is in regards to the meaning of cancer pain treatment. And they include things like, what do you think about taking pain medications? What are some of the things you consider or think about before you talk to your doctor or nurse about your cancer pain? And um, the final question that I like to ask is if you could choose between pain medication and other treatments for pain, what would you choose? And can you explain why? Because like I said before, oftentimes they're using home remedies and that, that you may prescribe them and the patient may not even take them. They may continue to use the home remedies. Okay, so um, aside from, from, from having a discussion with patients about managing their cancer pain, I feel like healthcare providers need to, to also utilize educational materials uh, to teach the patient because, you know, pain, these are, when pain is a really kind of difficult subject sometimes, but I think that when you use educational materials, you give them something there, the information, and it's something that they can take home and look back on. But, and we also know that educational materials can, are great at reiterating verbal communication. They can strengthen the teaching process 
Um, they can reinforce learning, enhance compliance, and also increase knowledge about cancer and management of symptoms related to cancer, such as pain. And I think when you talk about uh, educational materials or educating the patient in general, I think healthcare providers need to understand uh, the importance of culturally sensitive educational materials to patients. Because it's not just enough to provide patients with educational materials that are ethnically appropriate, meaning that, you know, it's a brochure and it has African-American people in it, but the language is all off. The, you know, the terminology is off. It's not simple. You know, it needs to be written at an appropriate um, grade level. You know, just simplicity is, is key. And so, you know, that's something that, um, people really need to, to think about. And so I often get the, the question about, so what is um, cultural sensitivity as it relates to cancer education messaging? And really it's based upon the use of linguistics and stylistic characteristics of the individual you're targeting. So clearly having an understanding of the cultural context of behavior can help to facilitate the transformation of health behaviors. And I think the ability of the, the, the people who develop these educational materials to place themselves within the context of the targeted population can help to facilitate developers, the developer's ability rather to capture the perspective of the target audience. And so people say, well, how do you do that? Well, you know, if you're developing these materials, perhaps using a focus group to find out you know, what's relevant and, and also it'll help you to understand key terms or whatever and translate that over kind of so that, you know, it can be, you know, understood by the, by, the, by the patient. So I think that's important. And additionally, you know, when you think about culturally sensitive educational materials, they, they, they just need to display ethnically appropriate men and women as role models. And they need to include ethnically appropriate vocabulary, like I said, and imprinted symbols. And so that, that's just something to, to keep in mind um, when uh, speaking or educating this population. And then finally, one of the things that I am a big advocate of is the use of lay health educators to deliver uh, education. And we know that this has worked in many chronic diseases among, that people uh, among um, people of color have experienced. So. Um, and, you know, lay health educators kind of function uh, as mediators, uh, social network and social support. So in support groups, you know, that's a good example. You see this, right? And so, but as it relates to cancer pain management, I think recruiting and training of, for instance, if you're looking at, at, at patients with breast cancer, you know, I think it's important to, to recruit uh, a person of color um, that is a lay survivor of breast cancer because they can effectively deliver uh, the information to their peers. And, and this can be very effective in overcoming barriers to effective pain management because the women may actually share, you know, similar language. The, the things we talked about, uh, social ethnic characteristics, religious beliefs, as do the, the target populations. Yeah, well, this was awesome, Dr. Washington. You've shared a lot of great nuggets, and I want to thank you so much for being with us. To watch or listen to more interviews like this one, visit us at lbbc.org. In addition, if you are looking to, to connect with other people, we encourage you to join our closed Facebook groups, Breast Cancer Support, All Ages, All Stages, and Breast Cancer Support Group for Young Women. Thank you, stay safe, and see you soon.